I have been always fascinated by science and math. Uh, and in retrospect, if I think through this, it is that uh, once you get the laws of physics and biology right, the rest is left to your imagination and you can actually practically do something with it. So today I'm going to talk about materials and inverse design, the two ideas which I think are going to change the world. So starting with one atom at a time. So we will go back to the past and look at the periodic table. You would have studied in your chemistry class, which is essentially classification of elements that are known to man in groups, essentially based on their atomic configuration. The materials themselves are collections of these atoms. So you essentially have properties which come with many of these atoms together. Now, if you were to look into the computer industry, so following upon the next talk, the previous talk, the 1980s essentially used about a dozen elements from the periodic table. These were essentially used more widely than others. But if you fast forward to today, we are essentially looking at so many of these elements today for the technology. This is about 60 in number. And as you can see that we are looking at anything that is not toxic or, uh, or radioactive or so. Now, at this particular point, I would like to talk a little about the design. Design 1.0, which you may know as natural evolution. And let me walk you through that. What nature does is it starts with a base design and then essentially try try out different patterns and combinations and see which ones stick and bypasses those which don't stick. And that essentially is the way the design goes forward without any intent that we could see. So to illustrate this, I have taken something from Christian de Duve's work. And what is shown here is our amino acids, essentially 27 of them, which are part of the protein that converts sugar into alcohol. And this is shown for wheat. Now, if you take 16 of these amino acids and essentially try to modify them, as the nature has, you will essentially end up with a fruit fly. So the fruit fly is essentially 16 of these amino acids changed from wheat. Now, if you take the fruit fly's amino acid sequence and they get 14 of them get modified, you essentially end up with the human. You can see there are two flip sides to this design. First is there is no intent in sight. So it could be an optimal outcome or non-optimal outcome. Then the second thing is it took a billion years to do this right. So since we don't have that much time at work, <laughs> we actually go to design 2.0, which is an inverse design. And we go back to nature. Now design 2.0 is something that is done in nature routinely, specifically the three-pound organ that we all have in our head called brain. Let me illustrate that with an example. Let us say you tasted an exotic dish somewhere, and you like the flavor and the order of the taste, and you want to get it into your pasta sauce. So you essentially know roughly what the ingredients are, and you would like to try out those ingredients to see whether you end up with the taste. So you had an end in sight, and you were trying out something else differently. And that is the concept in, in its simplest form, but that is what we essentially use for materials design. So we start with properties that we would like to have, and then look using computers as to what type of structures could give those properties, and what atoms would you need to put together to get these structures. So this is the concept of inverse design. At this point, most of you are thinking, OK, there are 70 or 60 elements, and there are known properties. It should be a simple, straightforward thing. But it's not. I'm showing you by these four charts why it is not. If you look at the number of elements that one could use, it's about 60 to 70. If you try to alloy them or try to mix them up into compounds, you essentially end up with over 100,000. Now, if you take two of these materials and try to create a junction, then you are essentially in the billions. And if you try to put four of these two for a structure, then you end up in trillions. So what started off as a few elements, now you are stuck with about over a trillion combinations of possibilities. 
There are many ways to address it. So what I'm going to show today are essentially two examples from that our teams have followed. The first one is it essentially started out with 48 starting structures, a simple example that was done by one of our collaboration teams. Then using principles from chemistry, geometry, and statistics, you could do a fast search and essentially end up with seven probable candidates. And once you get these seven probable candidates, you essentially rank them according to some metric and then do a deep dive on two of them. So essentially, this is doable in some form. Now, if you ask any senior researcher, they would say this is something which is a very hard problem. I hope you would agree. But what if I told you that this was done by four students who are barely out of their teens from four different universities with four different backgrounds? And when we told them that they can't do their Twitter or Facebook, they did it in three months. <laughs> Seriously, I think the reason they did it was they were paraphrasing one of Intel's founders, Robert Noyes. They were not encumbered by the knowledge that this problem is supposed to be hard. And that is something to do about your thinking. It is actually in the thinking of how this is done. Now, I'm going to show you a second example which is starting with the base material. This has two kinds of atoms, and this is a real material. And what you're seeing is essentially how this material was essentially built. And we had a set of target properties in mind that we wanted to go after. And so in order to engineer the material, we start with that, and then we pluck out the old material and put new materials in, which we think should have the properties. And as you can see, it is essentially filling it up, but not totally filling it up because the property essentially what we need is not that dense. But it also needs to keep the integrity of the mechanical structure, and that is an important thing for this material. Now, if you were to look inside, you will see that the new material, which is a hybrid of the old and the new, essentially has all the atoms, and you see some of the holes in the material. And this was essentially created on the computer. And if you now look at the properties of this material, we started off with a target on mechanical and optical property, and you see where we ended up with. Essentially, we ended up quite close to it. So this is not bad. So this essentially shows the viability of this technique as it could be used. And it is actually being used in one form or other in our 14 and 10 nanometer technologies and so on. Now, where are we going to go with this? So, this is about future and progress, this meeting. So for Design 3.0, I think I showed you that we had over a trillion combinations. If you do the math right, you will see that there are over six to seven trillion combinations of materials you could have just on the kind of uh, elements that we could use, which means, in principle, you could design for every human on the planet a material for an application not only for every human, but also for his or her pets. <laughs> and so in principle, you would be able to go and do that. Now, after you design it based on the intent you want, you could assemble them. And essentially, this is a structure that was assembled on the computer, and this is a work in progress. And then once this is assembled, this could be synthesized and manufactured using nanotechnology and 3D printing. And this could possibly be shipped to your home. So just like an app store, you would have a material store in which you could potentially dial in what you would need, and you would be able to get the material that you need, and there is the kind of material that would come up with. This doesn't exist in nature yet, but it will be tailored just for you. And uh, at this point, you're wondering, why do you need custom materials? Well, what would you do with it? As you have heard in some of the talks, maybe some of you already knew it, each one of us has a very distinct genome. And in, in an ideal case, the drugs we should take should be tailored for us. So all these principles could be used for essentially custom drugs. It could be used for custom body parts and custom prosthetics. And most importantly, the, each of us use the brain, which is uniquely connected for us. So what you could have is a custom intelligence, which essentially is a computer that understands your needs and would be able to do it. So actually, the future would be about custom 
in the sense, and it could be the, the possibilities could be enormous. Thank you.